camera. Hey guys, this is Allison from LA Cat Creations. How are you? Better. Sue? If you get anything from my work, I connected that. An epiphany, a mind blown moment, a new book to read, new authors to explore. Please consider supporting my work. Hit that like button. Share and subscribe if you haven't done so already. Get a lot of views. Don't get a lot of likes. Don't know why you'd be watching me if you don't like it. Please help me out, guys. So sorry I haven't I haven't done a video in two days. Sunday was very long. Very, 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 very long. I got to witness another kitten birth. Really cute. I celebrate a friend's birthday. And then yesterday, because I didn't get home until really late, I had to wake up really early in the morning because my gutters and downspouts got done. And that took all day. By the time they finished, I passed out. And then I got a phone call, frantic, please get us on Rumble. So I had to do a little bit of my voluntary job and by the time that done i went right passed out so i do apologize guys <sighs> such is life this secret doctrine by blavonsky this is gonna be a good chapter tree Serpent and crocodile worship. Sounds vaguely familiar if we venture Manly P. Hall. So, let's get started. I have some demons in my house I have to clear as well. Quote, Object of horror or of adoration, men have for a serpent an implacable hatred or a pros prostrate themselves before its genius. Lie calls it, prudence claims it, envy carries it in its hearts, and eloquence on its caduceus. In hell, its arms, the whip of the furies, in heaven, eternity makes it of its symbol. Some French dude, De Chateaubriand. I just took a snap at that last name. The Orpheites, Orphites, asserted that there were several kinds of genie from God to man, that the relative superiority of, of these was ruled by the degree of light that was accorded to each. And they maintained that the serpent had to be constantly called upon and to be thanked for the signal service it had rendered humanity. For it taught Adam that if he ate of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, he would rise his being immensely by the learning and wisdom he would thus acquire. Such was the ex exoteric reason given. It is easy to see whence the primal idea of this dual, Janus-like character of the serpent, the good and the bad, this symbol is one of the most ancient because the reptile preceded the bird and the bird the mammal. Thence the belief, or rather the superstition, superstition of the savage tribes who think that the souls of their ancestors live under this form and the general assertion of the serpent with the tree, the legends about the various things, it represents the numberless, but as most of them are allegorical, they have now passed into the class of fables based on ignorance and dark superstition. For instance, 
when Philostratus narrates that the natives of India and Arabia fell, fed on the heart and liver of serpents in order to learn the language of all the animals, the serpent being credited with the faculty, he certainly never meant his words to be accepted literally. As will be found more than once as we proceed, the serpent and dragon were the names given to the wise ones, the initiated adepts of olden times. It was their wisdom and their learning that were devoured or assimilated by their followers. Whence the allegory, when the Scandinavian Sigurd is fabled to have roasted the heart of Fafnir, the dragon whom he had slain, becoming thereby the wisest of men, it meant the same thing. Sigurd had become learned in the runes and magical charms. He had received the word from an initiated of the name or from a sorcerer after which the latter died, as many do after passing the word. Epiphy, Epiphanus, something like that, lets out a secret of the Gnostics while trying to expose their heresies. The Gnostic Orphites, he says, had a reason for honoring the serpent. It was because he taught the primeval men the mysteries. Verily so, but they did not have Adam and Eve in the garden in their minds. Their teachings this dogma, but simply that which is stated above. The Nagas of the Hindu and Tibetan adepts were human Nagas, serpents, not reptiles. Moreover, the serpent has ever been the type of consecutive or serial rejuvenation of immortality and time. The numerous and extremely interesting ratings, the interpretations and facts about serpent worship given in the natural genesis, are very ingenuous and scientifically correct, but they are far from covering the whole of the meaning implied. They divulge only the astronomical and physiological mysteries with the addition of some cosmic phenomena. On the lowest plane of materiality, the serpent was, no doubt, quote, the greatest mystery in the mysteries and was very likely adopted as a type of feminine pubescence on account of its slow slaughtering slowing in self-renewal it was so however only with regard to mysteries concerning terrestrial animal life for as a symbol of reclothing and rebirthing in universal mysteries its final phase or shall we rather say its incipient and culminating phases they were not of this plane they were generated in the pure realm of ideal light and having accomplished the round of the whole cycle of adaptness and symbolism, the mysteries returned from whence they had come into the essence of immaterial causality. They belong to the highest gnosis and surely this could have never obtained its name and fame solely on account of its penetration into physiological especially feminine functions. As a symbol, the serpent had as many aspects and occult meanings as the tree itself, the tree of life, with which it was emblematically and almost indissolubly connected. Whether viewed as a metaphysical or a physical symbol, the tree and serpent jointly or separately have never been so degraded by antiquity as they are now, in this our age of the breaking of idols, not for truth's sake, but to glorify the more grosser matter, the revelations and interpretations in the rivers of life would be astounded the worshipers of the tree and serpent in the days of archaic Chaldean and Egyptian wisdom. Even the early salvias would have recoiled in horror at the theories and suggestions of the author of the said work. The notion of pain night and inman that the cross of Tau is simply a copy of the male organs in a triadic form is radically false. 
right, at Mr. G. Massey, who proves what he says, but this is a statement that could be as justly applied to almost all the modern interpretations of ancient symbols. The natural genesis, a monumental work of research and thought, the most complete of the subject that has ever been published, covering as it does a wider field and explaining much more than all the symbologists who have here too written, does not yet go beyond the psychotheastic stage of ancient thought, nor were Payne Knight and Inman altogether wrong, except in entirely failing to see that their interpretations of the tree of life as the cross and phallus fitted the symbol and approximated it only on the lowest and last stage of the evolutionary development of the idea of the giver of life. It was the last and the grossest physical transformation of nature in animal, insect, bird, and even plant. For Bayoun, creative magnetism in animal, insect, bird, oh, sorry guys, rereading. Creative magnetism in the form of the attraction of the contraries or sexual polarization acts in the constitution of reptile and bird as it does in that of man. Moreover, the modern symbologists and orientalists, from first to last, being ignorant of the real mysteries revealed by occultism, can necessarily see but this last stage, if told that this mode of procreation which the whole world of being has now in common on this earth is but a passing phase, a physical means of furnishing the conditions to and producing the phenomena of life, which will alter with this and disappear with the next root race, they would laugh at such a superstitious and unscientific idea. But the most learned occultists assert that this, because they know it, the universe of living beings, of all those which procreate their species, is the living witness to the various modes of procreation in the evolution of animal and human species and races. And the naturalist ought to sense this truth intuitively, even though he is yet unable to demonstrate it. And how could he indeed with the present modes of thought? The landmarks of the archaic history of the past are few and scarce, and those that men of science come across of mistaken for finger, po finger posts of our little era. Even so-called universal history, plored regions of our latest filth, fifth root race, hence every fresh signpost, every new glyph of the honorary past that is discovered is added to the old stock of information to be interpreted on the same lines of pre-existing conceptions and without any reference to the special cycle of thought which that particular glyph may belong to. How can truth ever come to light if this method is never changed? I hear a lot of buzzing. And I forgot my fly swatter. This is the beginning of their joint existence as a glyph of immortal being. The tree and serpent were divine imagery, truly. The tree was reversed and its roots were generated in heaven and grew out of the rootless root of all being. Its trunk grew and developed, crossing the plains of Pleroma. It shot out crossways its luxuriant branches first, on the plane of hardly differentiated matter and then downward till they touch the terrestrial plane. Thus the Asvatha, tree of life and being, whose destruction alone leads to immortality, is said in the Bhagavad Gita to grow with the roots above and the branches below. The roots represents the supreme being or first cause, the logos, but one has to go beyond those roots to unite oneself with Krishna, who says Arjuna is greater than the Brahman and first cause, the indestructible, that which is, that which is not, and what is beyond them. It 
bows at, I'm going to butcher this, I'm just going to say Brahma, in its highest manifestations, say Sarvara, and I'm going to butcher that name, the highest dying Kohans or Divas, the Vedas are its leaves. He only who goes beyond the roots and shall never return shall reincarnate no more during this age of Brahma. It is only when its pure boughs and touch the terrestrial mud of the Garden of Eden of our atomic race that this tree got soiled by the contact and lost its pristine purity and that the serpent of eternity, the heaven-born logos was finally degraded in days of old of the divine dynasties on earth, the now dreaded reptile was regarded as the first beam of light that radiated from the abyss of the divine history. Various were the forms which it was made to assume and numerous the natural symbols adapted to it as across aeons of time, as from intimate time itself, Kala, it fell into the space and time, evolved out of human speculation. These forms were cosmic and astronomical, theistic and pantheistic, abstract and concrete. They became in turn the polar dragon and the southern cross, the alpha draconis of the pyramid and the Hindu Buddhist dragon, which ever threatens yet never swallows the sun during its eclipses. Till then, the tree remained evergreen for it was sprinkled by the waters of life the great dragon ever divine so long as it was kept within the precincts of the side rail fields but the tree grew and its longer boughs touched up touched at last the infernal regions of our earth then the great serpent nighog he who devours the corpses of the evildoers in the hall of misery human life so soon as they are plunged into Hugimir, the roaring cauldron of human passions, nigh the world tree. The worms of materiality covered the once healthy and mighty roots, and now ascending higher and higher along the trunk, while the Midgard snake coiled at the bottom of the seas and circles the earth and through the venomous breath makes her powerless to defend herself. That's all the Norse. There are all seven headed, the dragons and serpents of antiquity, one head for each race and every head with seven hairs on it, as the allegory has it. I, from An Ananta, the serpent of eternity, which carries Vishnu through the Mahabharata from the original primordial Sasha, whose seven heads become 1,000 heads in the Puranic fantasy, down to the seven-headed Akkadian serpent. That, this typifies the seven principles throughout nature and man, the highest or middle head being the seventh. It is not of the Mosaic Jewish Sabbath. The Filio speaks in his creation of the world when saying that the world was complete completed according to the perfected nature of number six for when that reason which is wholly in accordance with number seven has entered the soul rather than living body the number six thus arrest in all the mortal things which that number makes and again number seven is the festival day of all the earth the birthday of the world i know not whether all anyone would be able to celebrate number seven in adequate terms. The author of Natural Genesis thinks that the cemetery of stars seen in great in the great bear. The septurish and seven-headed dragon furnish a visible origin for the symbol symbolic seven of time above. The goddess of the seven stars he adds, was the mother of time as Kep, whence Kepti and Sebi, Septi for the two times in number seven. So this is the star of the seven by name. Skvet, the son of the gods, has the name of the seven 
or seven. So the skiff, I'm totally butchering that, Abu, who builds the house on high as wisdom Sophia built her with seven pillars. The primary chronotypes were seven and thus the beginning of time in heaven is based on the number and the name of seven on the account of the starry demonstrators. The seven stars as they turned around annually kept pointing as it were with the forefinger of the right hand and describing a circle in the upper and lower heaven. The number seven naturally suggests a measure of seven that led to what may be termed sevening and to the marking and mapping out of the circle in seven corresponding divisions, which were assigned to the seven great constellations and thus was formed the celestial Heptimus of Egypt in the heavens. When the stellar Hept Heptamos, something like that, was broken and broken up and divided into four quarters. It was multiplied by four, and the twenty-eight signs took the place of the primary seven constellations. The lunar zodiac of twenty-eight days being the registered result. In the Chinese arrangement, the four sevens are given to four genii that preside over the four cardinal points. In Chinese Buddhism and esotericism, the genii are replaced by the four dragons, the marahas of the stanzas. The seven northern constellations make up the black warrior. The seven eastern Chinese autumn constitute the white tiger. The seven southern of the vermilion bird and the seven western called vernal are the azure dragon. Each of these four spirits presides over the heptamus during the one lunar week. The generative of the first heptamus, heptamus typhoon of the seven stars are now, now took a lunar character in the phase we find the goddess Sifak, whose name signifies seven in the feminine word or logos in the place of the mother of time, who is the earlier word as goddess of the seven stars. The author shows that it was goddess of great bear and mother of time, who was in Egypt for the earliest times, the living word and the Skivet Kronos whose type was the crocodile dragon, the pre-planetary form of Saturn, was called her son and consort. Her, he was her word logos. The above is quite plain, but it was not the knowledge of astronomy, only that led the ancients to the process of sevening. The primal cause goes far deeper and will be explained in its place. The above quotations are no digressions. They are brought forward as showing, A, the reason why a full initiate was called a dragon, a snake, a naga, and B, that our cemetery division was used by the priests of the earliest dynamics in Egypt for the same reason and on the same basis as by us. This needs further elucidation, however. As already stated, that which M, Mr. G. Grassi calls the four genie of the four cardinal points in Chinese, the black warrior, white tiger, vermilion bird, and azure dragon is called in the secret books, the four hidden dragons of wisdom and the celestial nagas. Now, as shown, the seven-headed or sympathetic dragon logos had been in course of time split up, so to speak, into four hepatomic parts or 28 portions. Each lunar week has a distinct occult character in the lunar month. Each day of the 28 has its special characteristics as each of the 12 constellations, whether separately or in combination with other signs, has an occult influence either for good or for evil. This represents the sum of knowledge that man can acquire on this earth. Yet few are those who acquire it, and still fewer are the wise men who get the root of symbol 
of knowledge symbolized by the great dra root dragon. The spiritual logos of those <sighs> Sorry, guys. My eyes are darting all over the place. But those who do receive the name of dragons, and they are the arhats of the four truths of the 28 faculties or attributes, have always been so called. The Alexandrian Neoplatonists asserted that it, to become real Chaldees or Magi, Magi, one had to master the science or knowledge of the periods of the seven rectors of the world in whom it is all wisdom. And Proclius in Timius I'm going to butcher this name, but I'm going to try. And I have it right in my head, but it's not going to project out right. Jamplicus is credited with another version, which does not, however, alter the meaning. He says that the Assyrians have not only preserved the records of seven and 20 marauds of years, as Hippocrates says that they have, but likewise of the whole apostasies and periods of the seven rulers of the world. The legends of every nation and tribe, whether civilized or savage, point to the once universal belief in the great wisdom and cunning of the serpents. They are cha charmers. They have. They hypnotize the birds with their eye and man himself very often does not feel above their fascinating influence. Therefore, the symbol is a most fitting one. The crocodile is the Egyptian dragon. It was the dual symbol of heaven and earth, of sun and moon, and was made sacred in consequence of its amphibious nature. To Osiris and Isis, according to Ephibius, the Egyptians represented a sun in a ship as its pilot, the ship being carried along by a crocodile to show the motion of the sun in the moist space. The crocodile was moreover the symbol of Egypt herself, the lower as being the more swampy of the two countries. The alchemists claim, old, claim another interpretation. They say that the symbols of the sun in the ship on the ether of space meant that the hermetic matter is the principle or basis of gold, or again, that philosophical sun. The water within which the crocodile is swimming is the water of matter made liquid. The ship herself finally representing the vessel of nature in which the sun or the sulfuric Ignatius principle acts as a pilot being because it is the sun which conducts the work by his action upon the moist or mercury. The above is only for the alchemists. The serpent became the type and symbol of evil and the devil only during the Middle Ages, the early Christians, besides the Orphite Gnostics, had their dual logos, the good and the bad serpent. The Agathodemon and the Cacodemon. And again, guys, I, I'm going to put a pause two seconds. There's a lot of her book that I cannot pronounce, so I do apologize. I know it's probably frustrating for you as much as it is for me that I can't project these words out pronouncing-wise properly. And my dyslexia is at its fun point today. This is demonstrated by the writings of Marcus, Valentinus, and many others, and especially in Pista Sophia, certainly a document of the earliest centuries of Christianity, on the marble sarcophagus of a tomb discovered in 1852 near the Porta Pia, one sees the scene of the adoration of the Magi, or else remarks the late C.W. King and the Gnostics, the prototype of that scene, the birth of the new sun. The mosaic floor exhibited a curious design, which might have represented early Isis suckling the babe, Herpocrates, Herpocrat or the Madonna nursing the infant Jesus. In a smaller sarcophagi, the surrounded 
the larger one, 11 laden plates rolled like scrolls were found, three of which have been deciphered. The contents of these ought to be regarded to final proof of much vexed question, for they show that the either the early Christians up to the 6th century were bona fide pagans or the dogmatic Christianity was borrowed wholesale and passed in full into the Christian church, the sun tree, serpent, crocodile, and all. Quote, on the first is seen Anubis holding out a scroll. At his feet are two female busts. Below all are two serpents entwined, a corpse swathed up like a mummy. In the second scroll the, is Anubis holding out a cross, the sign of life. Under his feet lies a corpse encircled in the numerous folds of a huge serpent, Agameth de Demon, guardian of the deceased. In the third scroll, Anubis bears on his arm the outline of a complete Latin cross. At the god's foot is a rhomboid, the Egyptian egg of the world, towards which crawls a serpent coiled into a circle. Under the bus is a let letter W, repeated seven lines in a line, reminding one of the names. Very remarkable also is the line of characters apparently palmarine upon the legs of the first Anubis. As for the figure of the serpent, supposing these talesmen to an emanate not from the Isaac, but the newer Orphite creed. It may well stand for that true and perfect serpent who leads forth the souls of all that put their trust in him out of Egypt of the body and through the Red Sea of Death into the land of promise, saving them on their way from serpents of the wilderness that is from the rulers of the stars. And this true and perfect serpent is a seven letter God who is now credited with being Jehovah and Jesus with one with him to the seven vowed god the candidate of initiation is sent by christos in the pista sophia a work earlier than saint john's revelation and evidently of the same school the serpent of the seven thunders utters these seven vowels but the seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered and write them not says revelation do ye seek after these mysteries, inquiries, Jesus, and Pista Sophia? No mystery is more excellent than they, the seven vowels, for they shall bring your souls unto the light of lights, true wisdom. Nothing, therefore, is more excellent than the mysteries which ye seek after saving only the mystery of seven vowels and their forty and nine powers and the numbers thereof. In India, it was the mystery of the seven fires and their 49 fires or aspects or members thereof just the same. These seven vowels are represented by the swastika signs on the crowns of the seven heads of the serpent of eternity. In India, among exoteric Buddhists, in Egypt, in Chaldea, etc., and among the initiates of every other country. It is on the seven zones of post-mortem ascent in the Hermetic writings that the mortal leaves on each one of his souls or principles until arrived on the plane above all zones. He remains as the great formless serpent or absolute wisdom or the deity itself. The seven-headed serpent has more than one signification in the arcane teachings. It is a seven-headed Draco each of whose heads is a star of the lesser bear, but it was also and preeminently the serpent of darkness, inconceivable and incomprehensible, whose seven heads were the seven logi, the reflections of the one in first manifest of light, the universal logos. There's so much to say, and I'm not. This next session, section we're going to love it. Let's hope I don't butcher this time. Demon est 
Deus inversus. The symbolical sentence in its many-sided forms is certainly most dangerous in iconoclastic in the face of all the dualistic latter religions or rather theologies, and especially so in the light of Christianity. Yet it is neither just nor correct to say that it is Christianity which has conceived and brought forth Satan as an adversary, the opposing power required by the equilibrium and harmony of things in nature, like shadow to throw off, still brighter, the light, like night to bring into greater relief, the day, and like cold to make one appreciate the more the conflict of heat. Satan has existed. Homogeny is one and indivisible, but if the homogeneous one and absolute is no mere figure of speech, and if heterogeneity in its dualistic aspect is its offspring, it's by fear, by its shadow <laughs> or reflection than ever the divine homogeny must contain in itself the essence of both good and evil. If God is absolute, infinite, and the universal root of all and everything in nature and its universe, whence comes evil or devil, if not from the same golden womb of the absolute? Thus, we are forced either to accept the emanation of good and evil of Agathion demon or Kakio demon as offshoots from the same trunk of the tree of being or resign ourselves to the absurdity of believing in two eternal absolutes. Having to trace the origin of the idea to the very beginnings of human mind, it is but just, meanwhile, to give his due even to the proverbial devil. Antiquity knew of no isolated, thoroughly and absolutely bad god of evil. Pagan thought represented good and evil as twin brothers born from the same mother nature. So soon as that thought ceased to be archaic, wisdom too became philosophy. In the beginning of the symbols of good and evil were mere abstractions, light and darkness. Then their types became chosen among the most natural and ever recurrent periodical cosmic phenomena. <clears throat> the day and the night, or the sun and the moon. Then the hosts of the lunar and solar deities were made to represent them, and the dragon of darkness was constructed with the dragon of light. The host of Satan is a son of God, no less than the host of the Benai Alhim, these children of God coming to present themselves before the Lord, their father, the sons of God become the fallen angels only after perceiving that their daughters of men were fair. In the Indian philosophy, the suras are among the earliest and the brightest gods and become asuras only when dethroned by Brahminical fantasy. Satan never assumed an anthropomorphic individualized shape, uncertain until the creation of man and of one living personal God had been accomplished, and they and then merely as a matter of prime necessity, a screen was needed, a scapegoat to explain the cruelty, blunders, and but too evident injustice perpetuated by him, for whom absolute perfection, mercy, and goodness were claimed. This was the first karmic defect of abandoning a philosophical and logical pantheism to build as a prop for lazy man, a merciful father in heaven whose daily and hourly actions as natura naturines, that calmly mother but stone cold, bill the assumption. This led to the primal twins of Cyrus Typhon, Orismond Ar Armon, and finally Cain and Abel. 
of the contraries. Having commenced by being synonymous with nature, God, the creator, ended by being made its author. Pascal settles the difficulty very cuttingly. Nature has perfections in order to show that she is the image of God and defects in order to show, show that she is only his image, he says. The further back one recedes into the darkness of the prehistoric ages, the more philosophical does the prototypical figure of the later Satan appear, the first adversary in individual human form that one meets with old Puranic literature is one of the greatest rishis and yogis, Narada, surnamed the strife maker. And he is the Brahma Purta, a son of Brahma, the male, but of him later on, who the great deceiver really is, one can assert ascertain by searching for him with open eyes and unprejudiced mind in every old cosmogony in scripture. It is the anthropomorphized demiurge, the creator of heaven and earth, when separated from the collective hosts of his fellow creators, whom, so to speak, he represents and synthesizes. It is now the god of theologies. The thought is father to the wish. Once upon a time, a philosophical symbol left to perverse human fancy, afterwards fashioned into a fiendish, deceiving, cutting, and jealous god. Dragons and other fallen angels being described in other parts of this work, a few words upon the much slander Satan would will be sufficient, that which the student will do well to remember that is, with every people except the Christian nations, the devil is, to this day, no worse an entity than the opposite aspect in the dual nature of the so-called creator. This is only natural. One cannot claim God as a synthesis of the whole universe as omnipresent and omnisentient and infinite, and then divorce him from evil. As there is far more evil than good in the world, it follows on logical grounds that either God must include evil or stand as a direct cause of it, or else surrender his claims to absoluteness. The ancients understood this so well that their philosophers, now followed by the Kabbalists, define evil as a lining of God or good. Demon est duis inversus, being a very old adage. Indeed, evil is but an antagonizing blind force in nature. It is reaction, opposition, and contrast. Evil for some, good for others. There is no malum in se, only the shadow of light, without which light could not exist, even in our perceptions. If evil disappeared, good would disappear along with it from earth. The old dragon was pure spirit before he became matter, passive before the be he became active. And the Syro Chaldean magi magic, both Orphis and Orphomorphis, Morpheus, are joined in the zodiac at the sign of androgyny, Virgo Scorpio. Before its fall on earth, the serpent was Orphis Christos, and after its fall, it became Orphomorphistos. Everywhere the speculations of the Kabbalists treat of evil as a force which is antagonistic, but at the same time essential to the good, as giving it virtually an existence, which it could never have otherwise. There would be no life possible without death, nor regeneration and reconstruction without destruction. Plants would perish in eternal sunlight, and so would man, who would become an automaton Automaton, without the exercise of his free will and aspirations, after that sunlight, which would lose its being and value for him, had he nothing but light. Good is infinite and eternal only in the eternally concealed from us, and this is why we imagine it eternal. On the manifested planes, one equilibrates the other. Few are those theists and believers in a personal God who do not make of Satan the shadow of God, or who, confounding both, do not believe they have a right to pray to the idol asking 
its health and protection for the exercise of impunity of their evil and cruel deeds. Lead us not into temptation is addressed daily to our Father, which are in heaven, and not to the devil by millions of human Christian hearts. They do so repeating the very words put into the mouth of their Savior, and do not give one thought to the fact that they are meaning to contradict the point blank by James, the brother of the Lord. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither tempteth he any man. Why then say that it is the devil who tempts us when the church teaches us on the authority of Christ that it is God who does so? Only open any pious volume in which the word temptation is defined in its theological sense and forthwith you find two definitions. One, those afflictions and troubles whereby God tries his people. Two, those means and enticements which the devil makes us of to ensnare and allure mankind. If accepted literally, the two teachings of Christ and James contradict each other, and what dogma can reconcile the two if the occult meaning is rejected? Between the alternative allurements, wise will be the philosopher who will be able to decide whether God disappears to make room for the devil. Therefore, when he can read that the devil is a liar and the father of it, incarnate lie, and are told in the same breath that Satan, the devil, was the son of God and the most beautiful of his archangels, rather than believe that the father and the son are a gigantic personified and eternal lie, we prefer to turn to the pantheism and pagan philosophy for information. Once that the key to Genesis is in our hands, it is the scientific and symbolical Kabbalah which unveils, unveils the secret. The great serpent of the Garden of Eden and the Lord God are identical and are Jehovah and Cain one. The Cain who is referred to in theology as the murderer and the liar to God. Jehovah tempts the king of Israel to number the people, and Satan tempts him to do the same in another place. Jehovah turns into the fiery serpents to bite those he is displeased with, and Jehovah informs the brazen serpent that heals them. These short and seemingly contradictory statements in the Old Testament contradictory because the two powers are separated instead of being regarded as two faces of the of one and the same thing are the echoes distorted out by recognition by exotericism and theology of the universal and philosophical dogmas in nature, so well understood by the primitive sagas and sages. We find the same groundwork in several personifications in the Puranas, only far more ample and philosophically suggestive. I'm gonna put a kind of a pause right here because I do want to explain something. This is absolutely mind blowing to the extent of holy shit. Um, if you watch Morg Official, I suggest you do. He talks about Lucifer and Jesus being the same thing, one being the light and one being the shadow aspect of. And you can make the same claim about Lilith and Mary, the same aspect. If you look into the hermetic work, you have a positive and a negative pull, which a human both has, and you have a positive and negative pull in your body. So let's assume that the morning star is Jesus and Lucifer in the same breath. It's all of God's design and it is all of its manifested life. Like you have your good side and you have your bad side. You wake up one day, a raging hormonal itch. And the next day, you could be the sweetest little pumpkin pumpkin pie. So let's just take those things into consideration. This is genius. Genius. And I agree with this. 
total allegorical possible. Sorry, guys, I keep pausing. This thing has killed a lot of flies. And I send them all into the love and light. Back to the book. Thus, Polastia, a son of God, one of the first progeny, is made the progenitor of demons. The Rak Ashes, the tempers and the devourers of men. Pisacha, female demon, is a daughter of Danks Danksha, a son of God, too, and a god and the mother of all the Prishas, Padma Purana. The demons, so called in the Puranas, are very extraordinary devils that judge from the standpoint of European and orthodox views about these creatures, since all of them, Davanas, Deityas, Pishas, and the Rakashas, are represented as extremely pious following the precepts of the Vedas, some of them even being great yogis. But they oppose the clergy and ritualism, sacrifices, and forms just what the full-blown yoginis do to this day in India are no less respected for it, though they are allowed to follow neither caste nor ritual. Hence, all those Puranic giants and the Titans are called devils. The missionaries ever on the watch to show, if they can, the Hindu traditions no better than a reflection of the Jewish Bible have evolved a whole romance on the alleged identity of Polastia with Cain and the Rakashas with the Canaanites. The accused, the cause of the Noclean the deluge. Polsatia dwells in Kadara, he says, which means a dug up place, a mine, and Cain is shown in tradition and the Bible as the first worker in metals and, and a miner thereof. While it is very probable that the Galibrium, the giants of the Bible, are the Rakashas of the Hindus, it is still more certain than both are Atlanteans and both belong to the submerged races. However, it may be, no Satan could be more persistent in slandering his enemy or more spiteful in his hatred than the Christian theologians are in cursing him as the father of every evil. Compare their vitrupations and opinions given about the devil with the philosophical, philosophical views of the Puranic sages and their Christ-like Mansitude, when Parasia, Parasara, whose father was devoured by Rakasha, was preparing himself to destroy magically the whole race, his grandsire Vashita says a few extremely suggestive words to him. He shows that the irate sage on his own confession that there is evil and karma but no evil spirits. Let thy wrath be appeased, he says. The Rakashas are not culpable. Thy father's death was the work of karma. Anger is the passion of fools. It becometh not a wise man, by whom it may be asked if is anyone killed. Every man reaps the consequences of his own acts. Anger, my son, is the, is the destruction of all that man obtains and prevents the attainment of emancipation. The sages shun wrath. Be not thou, my child, subject to its influence. Let not those unoffending spirits of darkness be consumed. Let thy sacrifice cease. Mercy is the might of the righteous. Thus, every such sacrifice or prayer to God for help is no better than any act of black magic. That which Par Parasara prayed for was the destruction of the spirits of darkness for his personal revenge. He is called a pagan, and Christians have doomed him as such to eternal hell. 
Yet in what respect is the prayer of sovereigns and generals who pray before every battle for the destruction of their enemy any better? Such a prayer is in every case black magician, black magic of the worst kind concealed like a demon. Mr. Hyde under a sanctimonious Mr. Dr. Jekyll. In human nature, evil denotes only the polarity of matter and spirit, a struggle for life between the two manifested principles in space and time, which principles are one per se in as much they are rooted in the absolute. In cosmos, the equilibrium and must be preserved. The operations of the two contraries produce harmony, like the centripetal and centrifugal forces, which are necessary to each other, mutually interdependent, in order that both should live. If one is arrested, the action of the other will become immediately self-destructive. Since the personification called Satan has been amply analyzed from its triple aspect in the Old Testament, Christian theology, and the ancient Gentile attitude of thought, those who would learn more of it are referred to in volume two of Isis Unveiled. The present object, sorry, subject, is touched upon in fresh explanations attempted for a very good reason. Before we can approach the evolution of physical and divine man, we have first to master the idea of psych cyclic evolution to acquaint ourselves with the philosophies and beliefs of four races which preceded our present race to learn what were the ideas of the titans and giants giants verily mentally as well as physically the whole of antiquity was imbued with that philosophy which teaches the involution of spirit into matter the progressive downward cyclic descent or active self-conscious evolution. The Alexandrian Gnostics have sufficiently divulged the secret of initiations and their records are full of the sliding down of aeons and their double qualification of angelic beings and periods. <clears throat> the one, the natural evolution of the other. On the other hand, Oriental traditions on both sides of the black water, the oceans that separate the two Easts, are as full of allegories about the downfall of Pleroma, of that of the gods and divas. One and all, they allegorize and explain the fall as the desire to learn and acquire knowledge to know. This is a natural sequence of mental evolution, the spiritual becoming transmuted into the material or physical. The same law of descent into materiality and reascent into spirituality asserts itself during the Christian era. The reaction having stopped only just now in our own special sub race. That which perhaps 10 millenniums ago were allegorized in the Pymander in a triune character of interpretation meant as a record of astro astronomical anthropomorphical an even alchemical fact, namely an allegory of the seven rectors breaking through the seven circles of fire, <clears throat> was dwarfed into one material and anthropomorphic interpretation of the rebellion of the fall of the angels. The multivocal profundity philosophical narrative under its poetical form of the marriage of heaven with earth the love of nature for divine form and the heavenly man enraptured with his own beauty mirrored in nature spirit attracted into matter has now become under theological handling the seven rectors disobeying jehovah self-admiration generating satanic pride followed by the fall <clears throat> sorry guys jehovah permitting no worship to be lost save upon himself in short, the beautiful planet angels, the glorious cyclic aeons of the ancients became henceforth synthesized in their most orthodox shape in Samuel, Samael, the chief of the demons in the Talmud, that great serpent with 12 wings that draws down after himself in his fall, the solar system or the Titans, but the Shemal the alter ego and the Sabean type of Samuel, 
meant in the philosophical and esoteric aspect, the year in its astrological evil aspect is 12 months or wings of unavoidable evils in nature and esoteric theogony. Both Shemal and Samael represented a particular divinity with the Kabbalists. They are the, the spirit of the earth, the personal God that governs it, identical de facto with Jehovah. For the Talmudists admit themselves that Samael is a God name of one of the seven Elohim. The Kabbalists moreover show the two Samael and Shemael and Samael as a symbolical form of Saturn, Kronos, the 12 wings standing for the 12 months and the symbol of the collective collectivity re representing a racial cycle. Jehovah and Saturn are also glyphically identical. This leads in its turn to a very curious deduction from a Roman Catholic dogma. Many renowned writers belonging to Latin church admit that a, dis a difference exists and should be made between the Uranian Titans and the antediluvian giants, also Titans, and those post-diluvian giants in whom they, the Roman Catholics, will see the descendants of the mythical Ham. In clearer words, there is a difference to be made between the, cosmo the cosmic primordial opposing forces guided by cyclical law, the and <clears throat> goodness sakes, my allergies, the Atlantean human giants and the post diluvian great adepts, whether of the right or the left hand. At the same time, they show that Michael, the generalissimum of the fighting celestial host, the bodyguard of Jehovah, as it would seem, is also a titan only with the objective of divine before the cognomen, those Urantides who are called everywhere the divine titans and who having rebelled against Kronos, Saturn are therefore also shown in the enemies of Samael and Elohim also synonymous with Jehovah in his collectivity are identical with Michael and his hosts. In short, the roles are reversed, all the combatants are confused, and no student is able to distinguish clearly which is which. Esoteric explanation may, however, bring some order into the confusion in which Jehovah becomes Saturn and Michael and his army, Satan and the rebellious angels, owing to the indiscreet endeavors of two faithful zealots to see in every pagan god a devil. The true meaning is far more philosophical and the legend of the first fall of the angels assumes a scientific coloring when correctly understood. Kronos stands for endless, hence immovable, duration without beginning, without an end, beyond divide, time and beyond space. Those angels, genie or divas, who were born to act in space and time to break through the seven circles of the super spiritual planes into the phenomenal or circumscribed super terrestrial regions are said allegorically to have rebelled against Kronos and fought them, one living and highest God. In his turn, when Kronos is represented as mutilating Uranus, his father, the meaning of this mutilation is very simple. Absolute time is made to become the finite and the conditioned. A portion is robbed from the whole, thus showing that Saturn, the father of the gods, has been transformed from eternal duration into limited period. Kronos cuts down with his Sith even the longest and to us seemingly endless cycles, yet for all that limited in eternity, and puts down with the same Sith the mightiest rebels. Ah, not one will escape the Sith of time. Praise the god or gods or flout one or both, and that Sith will not be made to tremble one millionth of a second in its ascending or descending course. The Titans of Hezerod's theogony were copied in Greece from the Suras and Asuras of India. These Hes Hesedotic Titans and Urandes 
number once upon a time as six, having been recently discovered to be seven, the seventh being called Forg in an old fragment relating to the Greek myth. Thus, the identity with the seven rectors is fully demonstrated. The origin of the war in heaven and the fall has in our mind to be traced unavoidably in India and perhaps far earlier than the Puranic accounts thereof. For Taramaya was in a later age and there are the three accounts, each of the distinct war to be traced in almost every cosmogony. The first war happened in the night of time between the gods, the Asuras, and lasted for the period of one divine year. On this occasion, the deities were defeated by the Daitras under the leadership of Harada. After that, owing to a device of Vish Vishnu, to whom the conquered gods applied for help, the latter defeated the Asuras. In the Vishnu Purana, no interval is found between the two wars. In the esoteric doctrine, one war takes place before the building of the solar system, another on earth at the creation of man, and a third war is mentioned as taking place at the close of the fourth race between its adepts and those of the fifth race between the initiates of the sacred island and the sorcerers of Atlantis. We shall notice the first contest, as recounted by Purasana, well, trying to separate the two accounts purposely blended together. It is there stated that as the Daitras and Ashuras were engaged in the duties of their respective orders, Varana, and follow the paths prescribed by holy wit, practicing also religious penance, a queer employment of demons if they are identical with our devils, as it is claimed, it was impossible for the gods to destroy them. The prayers addressed by the gods to Vishnu are curious as showing the ideas involved in an anthropomorphic deity having after their defeat fled to the northern shore of the Milky Ocean, Atlantic Ocean. The discomfited gods address many supplications to the first of the beings, the divine Vishnu, and among others, this one, glory to thee who art one with the saints whose perfect nature is blessed. Glory to thee, who art one with the serpent race, double-tongued, impious, cruel, insatiate of enjoyment and abounding with wealth. Glee to thee, O Lord, who has neither color nor extension nor size, nor any predictable qualities whose essence, purest of the pure, is appreciated only by holy paramusha. Marshi, great, greatest sages of Rishis, we bow to thee in the name of Brahma, uncreated, undecaying, who art in our bodies and in all bodies, in all living creatures, besides whom nothing exists, who glorify the Lord of all, who is without soil, the seed of all things, exempt from dissolution, unborn, eternal, being the essence beyond the condition of spirit and in essence and substance, the whole of the universe. Wow. The above is quoted in the illustration of the vast field offered by the Puranas to averse an erroneous criticism by every European bigot who forms an estimate of an alien religion on a mere external evidence. Any man accustomed to subject that he reads to th thoughtful analysis We'll see at a glance the incongruity of addressing the accepted unknowable, the formless and attributeless absolute, such as the Vedidans define Brahma as being one with the serpent race, double tongued, cruel, and insatiable, thus associating the abstract with the concrete and bestowing adjectives on that which is freed from any limitations and conditionless. Even Dr. Wilson, who after living surrounded by Brahmins and pundits in India for so many years, ought to have known better. Even the scholar lost no opportunity to criticize the Hindu scriptures on this account. Thus he exclaims, the Puranas constantly teach incomparable doctrines. According to this passage, the Supreme Being is not the inert cause of creation only, but exercises the functions 
of the act of providence. The commentator quotes a text of the Veda in support of this view, universal soul entering into man governs their conduct. Incongruities, however, are as frequent in the Vedas as in the Puranas, less frequent in sober truth than in the Mosaic Bible. But prejudice is great in the hearts of our Orientalists, especially in those of reverend scholars. Universal soul is not the inert cause of creation or para Brahma, but cause that which we call the sixth principle of intellectual cosmos on the manifested plane of being. It is Mahat, the great soul, the vehicle of spirit the first primeval reflection of the formless cause and that which is every beyond spirit. So much for Professor Wilson's uncalled fling, for as the apparently incongruous appeal to Vishnu to defeat the gods, the explanation is there in the text of Vishnu Purana. If Orientalists would only notice it, there is Vishnu as Brahma and Vishnu in his two aspects philosophy teaches. There is but one Brahma, essentially Parakti and spirit. Therefore, it is not Vishnu, the inert cause of creation, which exercised the functions of an act of providence, but the universal soul that which E. Levy calls astral light in its material aspect. And this soul is in its dual aspect a spirit and matter, the true anthropomorphic God of the theists, as the God is a personification that universal creative agent, pure and impure, both owing to its manifested condition and differentiation in the Mayavic world, God and devil, truly. But Dr. Wilson failed to see how Vishnu in this character closely resembles the Lord excuse me, Lord God of Israel, especially in his policy of deception, temptation, and cunning. In the Vishnu Purana, this is made as plain as can be, for it is said that there, that at the conclusion of their prayers, the gods beheld the sovereign deity Hari, Vishnu, armed with the conch, the discus, and the mace, riding on Garuda. Now, Garuda is the Manavatric cycle, as will be shown in its place. Vishnu, therefore, is a deity in space and time, particular god of the Vishnavas, a tribal or racial god, as they have called it in esoteric philosophy. One of the many Dihans, or gods, or Elohim, one of whom are, was generally chosen for special reasons by a nation or a tribe, and thus gener became gradually a god above all gods. The highest god is Jehovah, Osiris, Bel, or any other of the seven regions. The tree is known by its fruit, the nature of God by his actions. The latter we have either to judge by the dead letter narratives or to accept allegorically. If we compare the two Vishnu as the defender and champion of the defeated gods, and Jehovah, the defender and champion of the chosen people, so called the antiphrase, no doubt, as it is the Jews who have chosen that jealous God, we shall find that both are deceit and cunning. They do so on principle of their end justifying the means in order to have the best of their receptive opponents and foes the demons. Thus, while according to the Kabbalists, Jehovah assumed the shape of the tempting serpent in the Garden of Eden, sends Satan with a special mess mission to tempt Job and harass and wears the Pharaoh with Sari, Abraham's wife, and hardens his heart against Moses, lest there should be no opportunity for plaguing his victims with great plagues. Vishnu is made in his Purana to resort to a trick no less unworthy of any respectable god. Have compassion upon us, O Lord, and protect us who have come to thee for succor for the deitas demoned. Pray the defeated gods. They have seized upon the three words and appropriated the offerings, which are our portion, taking care not to transgress the precepts of Veda. 
although we as well as they are parts of thee, engaged as they are in the paths prescribed by the Holy Writ. It is impossible for us to destroy them. Do thou, whose wisdom is immeasurable, instruct us in some device by which we may be able to exterminate the enemies of the gods. When the mighty Vishnu heard their request, he emitted from his body an illusory form, the deluder by illusion, which he gave to the gods and thus spake, this Mayama shall wholly beguile the deitas, as they, being led astray from the path of the Vedas, they may be put to death. Go then and fear not. Let this delusive vision precede you. It shall this day be great service unto you, O gods. After this, the great delusion, Maya Moha, descending to earth, beheld the deitas, engaged in aesthetic penance and approaching them in the semblance of the naked mendicant, who his head shaven, he thus addressed them in gentle accents. Ho, lords of the Deata race, wherefore is it that you practice these acts of penances? Finally, the Deata were secluded by the willy talk of the Mara Mora. As Eve was seduced by the advice of the serpent, they became apostates to the Vedas, as Dr. Muir translates the passage. The great deceiver practicing illusion next beguiled other deitas by means of many other sorts of heresy. In a very short time, these asuras, deluded by the deceiver, abandoned the entire system founded on the ordinances of the triple Veda. Some revile the Vedas, others the gods, others the ceremonial of sacrifice, and others the Brahmins. This, they exclaim, is a doctrine which not will not bear discussion. The slaughter of animals in sacrifice is not conducive to religious merit. To say that obligations of butter consumed in the fire produce any further reward is the assertion of a child. If it be a fact that a beast slain in sacrifice is exalted to heaven, why does not the worshiper slaughter his own father? Infallible other utterances do not great assure as fall from the skies. It is only assertions found in reasoning that are accepted by me and by other intellect, intelligent persons like yourselves. Thus, by numerous methods, the deitas were unsettled by the great deceiver. When they had entered on the path of error, the gods mustered all their energies and approached the battle. Then followed a combat between the gods and the asuras and the latter, who had abandoned the right road where smitten be by the former. In previous times, they had been defended by the armor of righteousness, which they bore. But when they had been destroyed, they also perished. Whatever may be thought of Hindus, no enemy of theirs can regard them as fools. A people whose holy men and sages have left to the world the greatest and most sublime philosophies that ever emanated from the minds of men must be known the difference between right and wrong. Even a savage can discern right from black, good from bad, and deceit from sincerity and truthfulness. Those who had narrated this event in the biography of their god must have seen that in this case it was the god who was the arch deceiver and the deitas who never transgressed the precepts of the vedas who had the sunny side in the transaction and who were the true gods thence there must have been and there is a secret meaning be hidden under this allegory in no class of society and no nation are deceit and craft considered a divine virtue except perhaps the clerical classes of the theologians and modern Jesuitism. The Vishnu Purana, like all other works of this kind, have passed a latter period into the hands of the temple Brahmins and the old MSS, have no doubt been once more tampered with by sectarians, but there was a time when the Puranas were esoteric works, and so they are still for the initiates who can read them with the key that is in their possession. 
Whether the Brahmin initiates were ever will ever give out the full meaning of these allegories is a question with which the writer is not concerned. The present object is to show that while honoring the creative powers in their multiple forms, no philosopher could or ever has accepted the allegory for the true spirit, except perhaps some philosophers belonging to the present superior and civilized Christian races. For as shown, Jehovah is not one with the super superior of the Vishnu or the plane of the ethics. This is why occultists, even some Kabbalists, whether they regard or not those creative forces as living and conscious entities, and one does not see why they should not be so accepted, will never confuse the cause with the effect and accept the spirit of the earth or Parabrahman or Ayan Sof. At all events, they know well the true nature of what was called Father Ether by the Greeks, Jupiter Titan. They know that the soul is an astral light, is divine, and its body, the light waves on the lower planes, infernal. The light is symbolized by the magic hand in the Zohar, the double face on the double pyramid, the black pyramid rising against a pure white ground with a white head and face with its black triangle. The white pyramid inverted the reflection of the first in the dark water, showing the black reflection of the white face. This is the astral light, or demon S. Deus Invertus. And that is going to end it there, guys. I'm sorry, I kind of suffered at the end. My allergies are exponentially going banana nuts. I don't know why. But you made it with me. Congratulations. Her work is always brutal, but it's awesome. And so true. So very true. Please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And check out all the links in the description. Sending each and every one of you protection, light, love, and shielding. And I hope to see you guys in the next one.